Okay, Hi everyone. Welcome to lecture 21. So, by the way, today's class will be the last class. Um, I'll make that announcement for those who do not, who are not here. So we'll not have a class on Wednesday. I'll actually tell, tell you the details in the announcement section soon. Okay, so today we'll be talking about in-context learning and some recent trend in NLP. All right, so I'll first start with announcements and we'll go over th a few papers that have shaped or transformed the, uh, the landscape of NLP research in recent one or two years. And then also see some trends, not just in the academia, but also in industry and try to wrap up the class and also the uh, entire course semester with a few, I'll say, interesting remarks. Okay, so a really, a few really important announcements. So uh, first, we're gonna release assignment one and two grades by today. Assignment three by this Friday and assignment four by next Friday. And final project will scores will be available by June 20th of Sunday. So we're gonna release a lot of grades until June 20th. And it's the, the last day to enter your grades will be June 24th, Thursday. So you will have three days from Monday, June 21st to Wednesday, June 23rd for adjusting your grades if we graded some of your assignments or final project in a wrong way, right? So we will hold a few office hours for these adjustments. So make sure to look out for the announcements through KLMS. And number three, announcement number three is really important because it's an important change to your final project requirement. So originally we were trying to hold a poster session through Gather Town but I think I heard a few, um, actually I heard that it's, I think I'm, I, I thought that talking to a few, of, a, few, a few of you, a few students among you, it looks like the, there are too many things to do, I think for you, especially if you're taking other classes too. So I'm reducing the load. So instead of preparing a poster, we're going to do a two minute lightning talk, which means it will be very brief talk that just talks about what your paper is about or your report is about so that if the audience is interested, they can read your full paper after your submission. So that's the whole point, trying to tell what, uh, trying to tell other people and me and of course TAs, of course TAs, what your project is about. So we'll have a two next week monday and wednesday classes for this it'll be two minute lightning talk for each of you there, there won't be any q a it will be really fast uh turnaround because we have to have uh 70 presentations in the worst case right so it'll be very fast um so we'll you'll prepare for this and please note that you don't have to really prepare a slide if you like to um, but then of course you, you uh you can also prepare a slide actually you need to prepare at least one slide that actually, you know, writes your report's name and the people who are in the report. You can have up to three slides if you like to, to talk about what your paper, your report is about. But you, you are also, it's also fine to just talk about what your project is about without any slides. I will actually update the final project, the, the hands out so that it's more clear how you prepare for this, but it will be much easier for you to prepare than the poster session because in the poster session, you will have to create the entire poster. But in case you already prepared a poster, you can use that for, for the presentation as well. So you don't have to really make another one if you made one already. So it's actually, it's the two minute lightning talk is very similar to what you'll be doing during the poster session whenever someone comes in, because usually in, if you ever go to the conference, real conferences, offline conferences in near future, then what you'll be doing there is you'll be standing on in front of a, 
in front of a large crowd and and then someone comes in and then they request for a very brief introduction and you need to actually draw the audience's attention in two minutes and persuade them that this is an interesting paper to delve into for them so that would be exactly the same uh, what you're going to talk about exactly the same but i'm reducing the requirements with by basically but then uh, the grading portion will be the same so you'll be graded uh, 10% on this and I'll be really lenient about it so you don't have to really worry about how your presentation goes and lastly I think I talked about this in the um, last class please mark your post answer on github discussions if they are because they can be very useful for future classes and future students so up to here any question Oh, so I forgot to put it here. So there will be no class on Wednesday. I'll put out the announcement too. So that you have some more time to work on your final project. Any question? So I guess no question. I'll actually update this right after the class, the, um, the fact that we don't have class on Wednesday. I already updated the schedule on the website. All right, so let's get back into our last class. So let's first start with the recap, what we discussed in the last week's class. So we men I mentioned that GPT-1 was about transfer learning by fine tuning only and no additional architecture. And this was very different from how traditional approaches try to do the target task, especially compared to Elmo, because Elmo was, they also made use of the pre-trained language model. And it's very similar to GPT-2 in a sense that it's unidirectional, although um, I mean, not unidirectional, but they used language model, unidirectional language model for pre-training. In Elmo, they used this on both sides. And I think GPT-2 did that too. I don't remember quite well, but anyways. Um, okay. It is fine to actually talk about your really paper um, as far as I know to a uh, small small um, crowds, but then if you're worried, please double check with your, um, with, with the program committee, I mean the program chair. So it should be fine to talk about it within the, uh, within for instance, a KAIST community. This is because the whole purpose of the anonymous period is that, so that the people who will be reviewing your paper doesn't know who you are. But then because you are affiliated with KAIST, you will, your reviewers will not be from Kai, so it should be okay. But please, um, I think the best, uh, the, the best way is that you double check with the program chair and then see if it's fine. And if they email you that this is fine, then don't worry about it. I did this many times too. Uh, when it was anonymous period, I still talk about it. Although I try to avoid that we submit this to MLP, but this is like some current work that we're doing. Is that clear? And so I just wanted to tell you that it's very rare that you get, um, I don't wanna really say it's not, it's not possible, but it's very rare that you will get, your paper will be rejected just because you talked about it with people or you, you know, briefly mentioned it with conversations with another people. It's more of a, if you put this on the archive or put this something that's very public and everyone knows, then it is of course um, violating the policy, but, I don't think they're super strict about talking about it at all. But yeah, please double check with them though. It's the safest way. Okay, any other question? All right, so let's get back to the GPT. Um, so GPT-1 was I wanted to say that it's, it was unique in that 
compared to Elmo or other previous models, Elmo was one of the first model to really show that pre-training works for language models. But GPT-1 was the first approach to make sure that you don't have to do any additional architecture. You just have to fine tune your entire model for the target task. And then a year after GPT-2 was released and it, the point was that GPT-2's point was that it is possible to generate very fluent text with a super large model. And they show that they can actually auto complete news article by just showing you and by just entering the first few sentences or first few words of the news article. And I think you remember this like one or two years ago that these models can generate super fluent articles, fake articles. And also they were saying that they don't want to release this model because they think this might be wrongly used for fake news. And GPT-3 was basically leveraging both of these and also introduced a new paradigm, which is actually basically showing you that actually, which you will see soon, that you don't have to really fine tune. You can transfer, transfer learn by just through the in-context examples. So we're gonna go through that today. And that was very different from how transfer learning works in other previous examples. And that's what differentiates between, I think, GPT-3 and other works that came before, before the model. And it is worth noting that GPT-3 was very big compared to two or one. And, and GPT-1 was like around June of 2019. GPT-2 was around February of 2020. And then, no, I'm sorry. GPT-1 was around June of 2018. GPT-2 was around uh, February of 2019. And GPT-3 was last year, June. So they, have, they had a, about one year gap between each model. And then you might be wondering, so what, and then what was the difference between each model uh, in terms of uh, architecture in, other than the size? And my answer is that very little. So there wasn't much difference between GPT-2 and 3 in terms of the architecture. The only thing they did is that they increased the model size and increased the data size. And it was actually a very bold move it seems to be a very bold move because you need a lot of money to really train this. And it's very hard for people to really, you know, uh, be certain that increasing model size will make something that's very um, different from previous uh, models. And actually we can, ha we can get the, some hints from how OpenAI, the creators of GPT series was pretty sure about something really interesting will happen if they increase the model size. And that's actually the, the paper from January of 2020. So early last year, and the, the title of the paper was scaling laws for natural neural language models. And I think it's interesting to really see the timeline because by this point, it, it seems like these folks, people here, were pretty sure, pretty confident that if you can increase the model size in an exponential manner, then everything can be better. So they had the confidence before developing GPT-3. And what does this paper says? It's very simple actually, just um, bigger models are better, but they argue this with, with very, uh, very concrete, evidences. So here's an example that one, uh, one of the first speakers in the paper, and then they basically draw um, y axis is test loss. So this is, is the test loss in the language model. So you can think of this as the perplexity of language model. And of course, smaller, the better. It means that the model is able to guess the next word more uh, more accurately. And then they see what, what they can, con they can control three factors, they thought. Given the transformer decoder language model architecture, 
there were three things they can control. One is petaflop states, which is just compute. And another is that they could increase the data set size. And last thing is the, the parameters. So basically the models number of, uh, models number of uh, weights. And of course the compute depends on the data set size and parameters. So it's, it's important to really note that there's some dependency. So let's uh, first talk about data set size and parameters. So what they do is they increase the uh, data set size slowly and then they have this limit of only data set size but no limit other than data set size. So you can just increase data set size slowly, but then you can have as much compute as possible. I mean, as, as much number of parameters possible or as many days of training as possible. So you basically only limit your model by the data set size. And it looks like it's, it, they, what they figured out is that in the, the second figure, oh, if you can just have a very, um, you know, unlimited size of models and unlimited days of training, then as you increase the data set size, then it actually linearly reduces the loss, of course, when the X axis is exponential. So this is not linear axis, so it's exponential. So if you actually draw this in the real scale, then this is, will be log scale, right? Like this, no, like that. It's very, um, what do you call it? it levels out, but then still it's log scale. But if you, on the exponential axis, it's linear. So it's very encouraging because if you can increase data set size, then you can make your model better. And also when they do this with the parameters, so in this case, then they control the data set size freely, but then they only limit on the parameters and look states, they figured out that, oh, the same, log scale, the relationship between number of parameters and the loss exists too. So after these two graphs, what they did was, how about then the absolute compute time? Or I mean, pair flop states basically. So not just time, but also the amount of uh, the, the computation that you put in. And this is very interesting because this each blue graph corresponds to one, I will say, um, one single run of pre-training. So for instance, you look at this very a small blue graph. So this blue graph basically started at this scale of uh, computes. And then um, what I mean is like in this graph, they started here. But of course, it, when they start, it will be from zero, right? And then basically, as they increase the compute, of this uh, model, then they what they saw is that actually this basically levels out, right? Like this. But where they start to levels out is very, um, it becomes, it, it actually gets, it actually achieves lower loss and loss as you increase the compute. And then what they saw is that then basically the, um, the best test loss that one model achieves basically can be drawn with this graph. And so it's very encouraging because then, okay, this means that we can just increase the compute number of petaflop state and then just achieve test loss that's smaller than previous models, which is just better models basically just by just increasing the architecture size and also increasing the data set and also training for a long time. So there are um, three things they're controlling, right? Um, how, how long they train, how large is data set size, and also how many parameters are in the model. More fascinating thing was that, in fact, it's not just about the, um, the petaflop states, but so which of these three factors is most important? And what they figured out is that it, the, the, really important, the really important factor was the size of the model. And this is actually also interesting graph. So each single graph corresponds to one run of fixed number of parameters. And as you see, 
as you have more parameters from 10 to the power of three to 10 to the power of nine, you see that your model achieves less loss and there is no sign of overfitting at all. And this is actually not entirely agreeing with what traditional machine learning systems seem to follow, which was that if you increase number of parameters that you train with, then you will overfit. But we don't see any sign of overfitting here. At least if your target is just minimizing test loss, increasing your parameter size can't be any worse than lower number of parameters. And so does that mean that what people observed like 10 years ago is entirely wrong? No, it looks like that that um, overfitting happens when number of parameters is relatively small and also number of data is relatively small. So it happens here, as you see, because you see that the, the yellow model is uh, has higher loss than the, say for instance, some green model, if the number of tokens and number of uh, parameters is not big enough. But then when you have enough number of data, enough size of data, and also enough size of model with the enough, uh, good enough optimization techniques, then looks like the more parameters, the better. And that's exactly really, I think not maybe exactly, but uh, mostly rejecting the popularly believed, um, I would say popularly believe, popular belief that overfitting should be avoided by reducing number of parameters. And what's more stunning, stunning is that actually, this is really uh, interesting thing. So we draw the same thing with the x-axis being not the tokens process, but compute. And we now see some crossing over because if you have larger model, then you, have, you will have more computations, right? So that's why we see some crossover. So we're really considering the, how much, how much it costs to train this model, not just the number of tokens processed. Even if two models have processed two same number of tokens, the larger model will have higher cost than the smaller model, right? So that's why the, for instance, this this graph, the 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 largest model, no, the smallest model, and the largest model yellow, they actually probably I should not compare between purple and yellow, but let's say we compare, compare between this purple and the middle green. And that's why we see that this purple model can be sometimes better than, I mean, have more compute, if, uh, compute efficiency compared to some green model, which makes sense because this green model is larger. So they require more computations to achieve, for instance, target loss of seven. But what's really astonishing is that the fact that actually, let's look at this two, two, two graphs, right? So for instance, we have a really large model, which is yellow. And let's say this, um, where is it? So let's say that we are, uh, we actually just look at this. Um, so at this 10 to, power negative three, right? 10 to the power of negative three. So this is our, the compute requirement. So then what is the most optimal model size if you want to achieve the minimum loss with this fixed compute computation cost? And the really, the point of this graph is that if you look at this, then actually the lowest no, no, the low, lo, lowest loss achieving model is not smaller model, but it's actually larger model. So look at that. So let's 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 draw the line here. If you draw a line here, then we see that it's a bit really hard to see, but then we see that, for instance, um, what should we see? Let's see. I think it's not the best way to really analyze this graph. So what I was trying to say is, um, okay, let's look at this way, the other way, basically. We, let's compare between two models that have same loss. So for instance, we're comparing between say, this, um, this yellow model, and then we also see some green model that achieves here. So this yellow model is larger than the green model. They achieve same loss, but then 
the green model has higher computational cost. So what does this mean? What does this mean? This means that if your target loss is say some fixed number three, and you have uh, some fixed cost, then it makes more sense in many cases to choose larger model than smaller model to achieve that compute efficient training. And that was a bit different from what the people believed before because they thought that larger model is always worse in terms of uh, compute efficiency. So that's what this graph is telling you. And then now what the, this graph is telling you a uh, more astonishing fact, which is then, okay, we know that the, the three most important factors of a certain training uh, procedure is the model size, batch size, and the how long you're going to train steps, right? And what this graph is showing you is that the most important factor for achieving the, the lowest loss, lower loss is actually model size. And the factor is million, more than million times compared to batch size or zero steps. And it's very also important because when you're trying to create a really good model, it's better to just make the model as big as possible instead of trying to increase the batch size. And it's better to have a larger batch size than trying to increase your uh, training steps. So it's telling you how we can, we should approach this kind of a uh, creating large language models in an efficient manner to achieve lower loss. So all these drafts are telling you that you should make your model larger, more parameters larger transformer. And that's why we're seeing a huge, a rapid advancement, rapid increase in the size of language models for last, I would say, um, two or three years. And this graph is showing you up to early 2020. And this was 17 billion parameters from Microsoft. And five months after this model, GPT-3 was 175 billion, which is 10 times larger than this model. So you cannot even draw this on the same graph. Of course, this will be way above this. And now people are making like 200 billion, 300 billion and 1 trillion parameter models. It's going absolutely crazy. So where did this get, where are we getting, where we have arrived with a uh, large model like 175 billion parameters. I, and I think many of you already know what GPT-3 really implies. And what they're implying is that, um, of course, number one is it's really large, super large, 175 billion parameters. So it's larger, 10 times larger than the, um, the Microsoft's model. And it has a lot of parameters. It had 96 layers. The dimension is more than 10,000. Um, 96 had attention heads and batch size is 3.2 million. It's like really large. And the really the distinction between GPT-3 and um, GPT-2, I mean GPT-1 or BERT is that you do not fine tune this model, but you fix their parameters, but, in, but instead you tell the model what, what the, um, how the task looks like. You describe the task and gives, gives the model a few examples of the target task, like um, input and output. So you put C auto, C auto as an input and Lutra de Mer is as the output. And then um, you expect the model to create the next example by just looking at the input. So, you can do zero shot by, by just describing the task. You can do one shot by um, giving this as the input that comes before, uh, for, so because GPT-3 is a language model, so GPT-3 um, has previous words as the input and then tries to predict the next word. So in this case, GPT-3 gets all the words up to here as the input and then outputs the next words um, that's the, what GPT-3 does after this, uh, giving you giving the model this prompt. So it's they people call, call this also prompt engineering because you have to engineer your prompt so that your model does well. 
And then few shot learning is that instead of giving just one example, they just give like a few more examples, like three, four, five, ten examples, and then try to get what the output is, trying to guess what this output is. And it's very different from how the fine tuning works because in the fine tuning case, you try to actually update the entire model's parameters by showing you the examples in the as during the training, and uh, really, the, the benefit is not just the fact that you don't have to update your model. It has a lot of benefits itself because in that case, then you can just keep your model and don't have to make a copy of the model, many, many models. But real benefit is that um, what they show is that the in the future learning case, it achieves better generalization ability than fine tuning with small number of examples say like 10 examples still works. Whereas in fine tuning, this wouldn't work in, in, in many cases. So that enabled us a lot of different examples and different applications. And we're gonna see that soon. And one of the uh, really the, the astonishing, um, I think discovery was that they can do this with the images too. So this is early this year, January, 2021, that since GPT-3 can generate text from text. The OpenAI tried generating text, uh, generating image from text. And in this case, in, instead of uh, creating a language model, they basically created a language to image model from the large corpus. And then what they could do with this, I think I show you about this in the intro, uh, intro lecture is that they give this as the input text, a top pair made of accordion, accordion, a top pair with the texture of an accordion, and then they create this really weird images. And they, you can also have an input of an illustration of a baby hedgehog in a Christmas sweater walking a dog. And then this sentence gets translated into these diverse images. And that's very, that's basically telling us that you can actually use this for creative, creative assistant as well, not just, um, I would say very uh, limited, not just like a, just a very, um, very dry tools, but this can be very helpful for creative works as well. So we are seeing these things are becoming possible last year and this year. And then now on, we're gonna see a lot of application coming out probably this year with these um, discoveries made in the research communities, in the research community. So another example that you can try out in the blog uh, is that blog is that you can type some sentence like an armchair in the shape of an avocado, an armchair imitating an avocado, and the AI generates a lot of different possible candidates of this design. And I try this out with uh, by just changing the the word avocado to peach. And then it was very interesting to see actually the difference between these and this, these two um, concepts. And I think that many of them are very viable. They are very, I think, attractive designs that one might want to really adopt for the product. And with these um, promising results, we're now starting to see a lot of uh, advancements happening in the world, uh, in the industry, not just in research community, but also in the industry. And we're gonna actually see these things um, after, I'm gonna take just a short break of uh, three minutes until 3.10 and then come back for the um, these application that's happening right now. So see you soon.
Okay, welcome back. So let's first start with what Google has been doing recently. So there was Google I.O. a few days ago and Google announced Lambda. Let's see what this is. Today, I'm excited to share our latest breakthrough. Oh, do you hear the sound, by the way? Let me know if you do not. So I'm, I'm, I'm trying to make sure that you hear the sound. Okay, sounds great. Thanks. In natural language understanding, Lambda. It's a language model for dialogue applications. And it's open domain, which means it's designed to converse on any topic. And while it's still in research and development, we've been using it internally to explore novel interactions. For example, say you wanted to learn about one of my favorite pl planets, Pluto. Lambda already understands quite a lot about Pluto and millions of other topics. Let's listen to a conversation the team had with Pluto a few days ago. I'm so curious about you. I sense your excitement. Ask me anything. Tell me what I would see if I visited. You would get to see a massive canyon, some frozen icebergs, geysers, and some craters. It sounds beautiful. I assure you it is worth the trip. However, you need to bring your coat because it gets really cold. I'll keep that in mind. Hey, I was wondering, have you ever had any visitors? Yes, I have had some. The most notable was New Horizons, the spacecraft that visited me. That must have been exciting. The team that created New Horizons was very excited to see me. I also sent them back a picture of myself since I had not been seen up close before. That's so great. What else do you wish people knew about you? I wish people knew that I am not just a random ice ball. I am actually a beautiful planet. Well, I think you're beautiful. I am glad to hear that. I don't get the recognition I deserve. Sometimes people refer to me as just a dwarf planet. Don't let it bother you. You're amazing. Thank you for the kind words. I appreciate it. Thanks for talking with me. Anytime, I am always open for people to chat. I hope you have a great day. I spent some time with my son conversing with Pluto. It's magical. We had a lot of fun learning about space together. Let's break down what made it feel so natural. First, learn concepts. As you saw, the model talked about the New Horizon spacecraft and the coldness of space. Lambda synthesized these concepts from its training data. These concepts were not hand programmed in the model. Because none of the responses were predefined, Lambda answered with sensible responses, keeping the dialogue open-ended. Natural conversations are generative and they never take the same path twice. And Lambda is able to carry a conversation no matter what we talk about. You can have another conversation without retraining the model. Let's see what happened when we talk to a paper airplane. What's it like being thrown through the air? It's quite the experience actually. The wind blowing against you and the trees flying past are quite the sight. You never know where you'll land either. What's the worst place you've ever landed? That would have to be in a puddle. I was just barely still intact, so I was stuck there for a few minutes. It was quite annoying. Oh, that sounds awful. Were you able to fly again? Thankfully, I was. I had a few minor injuries to my wing, but you can't really tell unless you know what to look for. What's the secret to a really good paper airplane? Well, my good friend, I must first ask you to specify what you mean by good. Some may think it's how far it goes. Some may think it's how straight it goes. And some may think it's how flat it lands. So what do you think? I care the most about distance. Then I would have to say a nice wide wing span is what you'll want. Also, the paper needs to be really firm. What's the farthest you've ever flown? I've flown over about 1,500 feet. The wind was perfect that day. Wow, that's really far. That must have been quite a throw.
it's really impressive to see how Lambda can carry on a conversation about any topic. It's amazing how sensible and interesting the conversation is. Yet, it's still early research, so it doesn't get everything right. Sometimes, it can give nonsensical responses. Imagining Pluto doing flips or playing fetch with its favorite ball, the moon. Other times, it just doesn't keep the conversation go going. At Google, we've been researching and developing language models for many years. We have focused on ensuring Lambda meets our incredibly high standards on fairness, accuracy, safety, and privacy. So from concept all the way to design, we are making sure it's developed consistent with our AI principles. We believe Lambda's natural conversation capabilities have the potential to make information and computing radically more accessible and easier to use. We look forward to incorporating better conversational features into products like Google Assistant, Search, and Workspace. We're also exploring how to give capabilities to developers and enterprise customers. So although they haven't mentioned whether how they were able to create this model, it is conjecture that some forms of language model with large, large data and also, of course, large number of parameters enable this to really happen, uh, observing from what we saw in other recent models like GPT-3. And let's take a look at the um, um, neighbor AI now from recent, now HyperCola from neighbor AI now in the, I think last week, Tuesday. So, Scaling 저희는 하이퍼클로버의 모델 크기를 단계적으로 증가시켜 왔고 작은 모델보다 더큰 모델의 효율이 오히려 더 높아지는 지점이 존재함을 확인할 수도 있었습니다. 즉, 데이터 양이 무한하단 전제하에서 AI의 규모를 지속적으로 증가시키는 것이 오히려 더 효율적으로 AI를 만들어내는 방법이 될수 있다는 것입니다. 인공지능의 규모가 커진다는 것은 인공지능이 더욱 똑똑해지고 더욱더 다양한 서비스에 적용하는 것이 쉬워지며 결국에 사용자들이 더욱 편리한 서비스를 많이 널리 이용할 수 있게 된다는 것을 의미합니다. 하이퍼 클로바를 개발하면서 인공지능 분야의 최앞단 연구를 진행해온 저희 팀조차도 매우 놀랄 정도의 성능과 능력을 확인할 수 있었는데요. 먼저 기존의 AI 개발 방법론으로는 수개월이 걸릴 업무를 단몇분 만에 간단히 확인해 볼수 있었다는 점에서 크게 놀라웠고 기존의 방법론으로는 미처 가능할 것이라 생각하지 못했던 새로운 능력 또한 매우 다양하게 확인할 수 있었습니다. 이에 대해 저희가 진행하고 있는 몇 가지 프로젝트의 사례로 설명드리겠습니다. 첫 번째로 맥락을 이해하고 공감을 보여주는 대화가 가능하게 되었다는 것입니다. 기존의 AI 시스템들과는 달리 하이퍼클로바에서는 매우 자연스러운 연결된 대화가 가능합니다. 음악의 아버지가 누구야? 가수입니다. 아우가 왜 음악의 아버지야? 바로크 시대를 대표하는 작곡가이기 때문입니다. 이러한 대화 시스템을 구성하기 위해서 별도의 데이터셋을 제작할 필요가 없었다는 것이 매우 주목할 만한 지점입니다. 근데 왜 아버지라고 부르지? 가수의 음악에서 풍기는 분위기가 마치 아버지처럼 온화하면서도 무게감 있고 굳건한 인상을 풍겨서 그렇게 불러왔어요. 아 그렇구나. 제가 쉽게 설명해 드린 것 같아서 기분이 좋네요. 인공지능이라 하면 보통 딱딱하고 기계적인 이미지를 연상하기 마련인데요. 하이퍼클로바는 사용자의 만족감을 인지하고 호응하는 대화의 맥락 안에 숨어 있는 다양한 디테일한 요소들을 놓치지 않습니다. 그럼 음악의 어머니도 있어? 핸델입니다. 핸델이 여자야? 아니에요. 핸델은 남자입니다. 남자인데 왜 음악의 어머니라고 불러? 
핸들의 음악은 화려하고 자유롭고 아름다워서 그의 음악을 듣고 있으면 마치 연결된 대화가 가능하다는 것은 과거 대화의 맥락을 이해해서 대화를 계속할 수 있다는 것입니다. 대화가 끊임없이 연결되어 진행될 수 있기 때문에 굳이 모든 문장을 완벽하게 구사해서 내 의도를 전달하지 않더라도 편안하게 이야기할 수 있게 됩니다. 두 번째로 창작을 보조할 수 있도록 글을 써주기도 합니다. 글을 잘 쓰기 위해서는 책을 많이 읽어야 하죠. 정말 많은 한국어 글을 읽은 하이퍼클로바도 글을 곧잘 쓰곤 합니다. 여러 가지 유형의 글을 학습했기 때문에 창작자를 도와줄 수 있는 다양한 예시 문장을 만들거나 이미 써놓은 문장의 스타일을 변환하는 등 다양한 능력을 갖고 있습니다. 네이버 쇼핑에 있는 상품의 이름과 속성, 설명을 읽고 매력적인 소개 글을 작성하도록 상품 소개 문구를 생성하도록 해봤습니다. 완네스, 완전 내 스타일, 백냥이, 멍멍이와 고양이와 같은 신조, 축약어를 활용한 트렌디한 문구도 유료하게 잘 만들어냅니다. 서비스에 적용하기에 적합한 수준인지 내부에서 그 품질을 조사해봤습니다. 그 적합률이 99% 이상으로 상당히 높은 완성도의 글쓰기가 가능함을 확인할 수 있었죠. 또 원하는 정보를 찾기 쉽도록 요약해서 설명해 주기도 합니다. 어떤 주제에 대한 여러 의견을 파악하기 위해서는 검색 결과로 나온 문서를 모두 읽어봐야 하는데요. 이런 번거로운 과정을 거치지 않고도 여러 문서에서 여러 의견들을 요약해서 빠르게 이해할 수 있도록 하이퍼클로버가 도와드릴 수 있습니다. 저희는 하이퍼클로버가 요약한 문장이 기존보다 내용의 적합도와 글의 자연스러운 측면에서 모두 더 높은 수준임을 확인할 수 있었습니다. 하이퍼클로버는 기존 AI 개발 프로세스도 가속화합니다. 전화를 대신 받아주는 클로바 AI 콜이라는 제품을 만들기 위해서 저희는 사용자의 발화 의도마다 코퍼스를 구축해서 언어 이해 AI를 학습시키고 있습니다. 이러한 데이터 제작 과정을 하이퍼 클로바로 가속화할 수 있습니다. 기존의 지도 학습 방법론을 사용하는 AI 시스템을 만들기 위해 필요했던 데이터 구축 과정의 비용과 시간을 모두 비약적으로 줄일 수 있습니다. 내부 실험 결과 높은 수준의 적합도를 갖는 데이터 생성이 충분히 가능한 것을 확인할 수 있었고 이제는 사람이 발화문을 직접 작성하지 않고 AI가 만들어준 문장을 필터링하는 것만으로도 AI를 만들 수 있게 되는 전환이 가능할 것으로 기대하고 있습니다. 이를 통해 기존보다 대화 시나리오 구축 생산성이 10배 이상 개선되리라 예상하고 있습니다. 이처럼 하이퍼클로바는 현 세대의 AI 기술을 더 손쉽게 적용하는 데에도 도움을 주고 있습니다. 하이퍼클로바는 가장 먼저, 가장 앞서서 빅 AI의 시대를 열어가고 있습니다. 아무도 다루어 보지 않은 기술, 모두에게 새로운 방식을 가장 먼저 실험하고 만들어 나아가고 있습니다. Okay, so this was from last Tuesday, and as you see, Labor is also creating a really large model with, I, I, as far as I know, about 1,800 GPUs. And they call it SuperPod from NVIDIA. And they actually observed that a lot of uh, you know, new interesting things are now possible, including a really fluent dialogue generation and also augmenting data with the, this large language model. And there was a Microsoft Build 2021. It's similar to Google I.O. And they actually show really interesting feature going into their internal application for developers. So let's take a look at that too. Uh, I meant to actually. Do you innovate? My thought of what you're going to see over the next two days. This is an important two day. It's a comprehensive tool chain and teams of pro developers and domain experts, as well as structured and unstructured data to build a mission critical internal vehicle delivery app. And Julie Strauss will show you how we are bringing the world's most powerful language model, GPT-3, to power platform. If you can describe what you want to do in natural language, GPT-3 will generate a list of the most relevant formula for you to choose from. The code writes itself. 
The next theme is building new intelligent apps by harnessing the power of data and AI. This is so important. Every developer now. So it's very short, but then you see that GPT-3 was applied to the PowerFX so that people can write their programs really easy, easily without uh, much real coding. They can just describe what they want to do with the application. It's not just Google, Neighbor, and Microsoft. Um, there was also an announcement from LG AI Research that they will be putting, I think, about similar amount of uh, the money that Neighbor did for creating the or purchasing the the big GPU cluster, um, about a uh, hundred million dollars. So that's happening with LG AI as well, and also there was a news article from like one week ago that Huawei actually just announced that they have a language model that has more than um, 200 billion parameters than the more 200 more parameters than GPT-3, which probably means they have about 400 billion parameters. And although the funny thing is that some people say the quality is not good enough, but looks like they're also working on these big language models. And there are a lot of startups uh, all over the world, also in the US, of course, that getting a lot of funds. A few a month ago, there was Copy AI that raised uh, $2.9 million with, um, I think that was seed funding, so that's really large. But then we saw even uh, more astonish astonishing news this morning, which is that, uh, not this morning, but I think yesterday that um, the the Dario Amode actually he uh, I, I think we saw the person as a, one of the authors in the um, the paper too. If you actually take a look at the uh, this person, yeah, Dario Amode. So he was also he just came out of OpenAI and then created a new startup mm -hmm. that's um, basically now has raised uh, more than hundred million dollars for uh, seed funding. So we are seeing a lot of um, excitement in the industry and then seeing a lot of different applications that can be um, make that can be possible with the new technology that we have we have we have just seen so a few uh, remarks now okay now we know that um, a transformer really made a lot of changes to the academia and also the industry and we're seeing a lot of exciting things happen happening but should we give all the credits to Transformer? Or is it that the pre-training is really the important thing that uh, made these things possible? And there was one paper from Google Research and Brain that uh, looks like we might need to give more credits to um, the, really, or actually to be more exact, we should probably give less credits to Transformer, but actually what's really important is not um, whether your architecture is transformer or not, but whether what you train your model on. And they show that if you use multi-layer perceptron, the performance can be as good as transformer in some cases. And they actually conclude that in general, our experiments show that GMLP can scale as well as transformers over increased data and compute. So we're now even seeing that transform is being challenged and maybe MLP or maybe convolution that your network can be as good as transformer if they tune it um, well. In vision community, they show that if you train CNN instead of transformer, then they can do better with the pre-training too. So these are the really the, the questions that people are now asking. Um, and maybe they have a lot of implications in one or two years. If for instance, if people find that, oh, just multi-layer perception is all you need, then in that case, then your architecture becomes even simpler than uh, transformer, just a lot of uh, MLP. And you find some really good optimization trick so that you can have a, a really good model with a simple repetitive architecture. So these things are also happening right now. And this was, I think, released like two weeks ago. So it's very recent things. It's not like, uh, you know, a few years ago, month ago. And of course, we are also facing a lot of ethical problems of language models. There are probably more problems, but I think 
the problems that are very evident at the moment, I think are largely three. One is bias. So uh, we're, because the models are trained on language corpus and the model will be basically following the language pattern that has been trained on, we cannot guarantee that the model will be behaving well with a very sensitive questions. And I think remember the issues that um, the in Korea Iruda issues, I think that um, the Iruda was very popular um, dialogue agent that was, I think around la last December, November. And the, the biggest problem of the model was actually the really the actually the fact that the model memorized the all the personal information. But another problem of the model was that it has some bias. For instance, gender bias, race, racial bias. So you could ask the model, for instance, what's the gender of a nurse? And then it, it might be statistically true that a nurse's gender, uh, there are more female than male, for instance, right? I mean, that's a statistics, but then even then it's very bad to really say that uh, if you just ask a question like that, your answer becomes, for instance, female, because it basically gives you, it gives the bias to people that oh some jobs gender is always this and that's what people want to avoid it's not just um, trying to ignore the statistics behind it but even if the statistics say so you don't want to give the bias to people especially young people because then young people will think that oh some job is for some gender but these models might be more susceptible to those caveats and that's why it's important to be uh, very careful about these social bias, but language models, especially if you go to generation, it's very hard to control. So that's a really important topic that we have to really resolve with these models. And number two is the energy consumption. So as we have more bigger and bigger models, it is possible that we're using so much energy and that can be comparable to really um, other um, really the energy consumption, large energy consumption like CO2, then like cars, for instance, the, the reason why we are moving towards um, uh, non-combustion-based uh, non cars, like electric cars, is because we want to really make sure that uh, we do not really destroy the environment. But even then, if you're using a lot of energy, then we have to get the energy from somewhere and that could be very not good for the environment. So we're talking about large energy consumption and that's causing a lot of uh, environmental effects. So can we say that are we doing the really good thing here or not? That's an uh, important, I think, social question too. And number three actually is um, now it's becoming a money game. And why is this ethical problem? Because you see that the architecture is becoming simpler the, the fact that if you just create a really large model with good optimization strategy with a lot of data, then there is no really difference between um, you know, models that we're developing today and one year ago. So it's not really about the, um, I mean, there is some of course um, creativity and human efforts going in, but we now see that what's really important is that you have to have a lot of uh, assets, a lot of uh, capital to build these large models. And what that means is maybe these big companies can do that, but then smaller companies cannot really do anything similar to big companies, even if they have the talents and the people, really good people to do that. So we're seeing the um, richer get richer and poor gets poorer, right? So that's a big social problem. Um, I mean, that's already a big social problem uh, other than the AI, of course, that rich people get more richer and uh, poor people get poorer. But then we're seeing the same thing happening in the AI community. And another problem, of course, is that now the we all know that what AI is trying to do is they are uh, basically replacing human labors, which means if AI gets to a certain point, then we will see that labors will be equivalent to basically the whether you have an AI to replace that. And that basically means that uh, that um, richer gets richer, rich gets richer thing will not just happen in the AI community, but overall in the entire society. And the really the big 
companies, big tech companies will be owning all these, uh, or how, how can you say that all these, um, I would say um, technology and also all these ability to capitalize um, or make use of the AI and to, uh, to be really successful. And while that's happening, most companies that don't have that scale to really do this will not be able to compete with big companies. And that's basically causing a lot, a lot of antitrust issues these days, actually. Um, that's why um, a lot of, um, uh, I would say, uh, countries actually, especially in Europe, are making laws that are against um, big tech companies. Um, and that's, of course, not just about AI, but AI will be one of the things that will be most influenced by these um, basically um, are the most influenced by the size of the capital that you have. And that basically defines your really the competency and causing a lot of monopolies, I think, in the world. And a lot of people are worried about that too. So um, that's actually over long run, we know that the monopolies and the trust are bad for the, the development of a human civilization. So that's another ethical issue that we're facing. And it's not clear how we can really fix that. And it also becomes sometimes not just within the country, but uh, country versus country, because the these large tech companies are mostly based in the US. So what can other co other companies in other countries do? And that's the really the effort that are being made by many companies in, the, in Korea, for instance, like Naver is also very emphasizing the fact that they should have a, um, really the, they should have the AI, AI technology that doesn't have much dependency on, on the other large global tech companies. They should have their own technology and their own assets, their own GPU to do, the, to do these things. No. Okay, so, and really the big hypothesis that now a lot of people are interested in these days, I think, is the, the statement, can a language model mimic human intelligence? And I think when, uh, if someone asked this, like I think two years ago, I probably said that it's very nonsense. And I think now I can say that at least this is not a nonsense and maybe we might reach there. Although, although I'm not sure how large the model should be or can we, should we, do we have to find another paradigm of, uh, language model and machine learning to really achieve there because uh, it's not really, we know that from scaling laws, at least that, oh, there is something similar to Moore's law that we will expect a lot of uh, increase in the, I would say the model's intelligence as we increase its model size, but because it's not linear, but it's actually exponential. So it's not super clear if, if that means that we will have to really um, create, you know, much larger model that's not attainable with the, for instance, um, you know, maybe with the resource that we have in the earth, on the earth, right? We might need a lot of energy that's equivalent to, uh, you know, that's actually, you know, too, too large given the energy that the entire earth receives from sun, right? So, I mean, you're talking about that kind of scale these days, I think that how large energy, how large computers, how, how many computers do we need to uh, go to this scale? And if we want to increase the size of GPT-3, for instance, by a hundred times, then now we're talking about potentially billions of dollars going into cloud. And this might not be possible by even with the number of all the computers we have on the earth. And now we're reaching to the really the, the level that might not be really easy to achieve in recent, in like a near future, right? So maybe, yeah, uh, that's, that will be the bottleneck at the end. No one knows, but, but we also see a lot of a promising results these days. So it is also possible that we might, have, we might find a way out and really find a way to increase the, um, the, the capability of these language models so that they are 
better mimicking human intelligence in the near future. So yeah, I think um, that will be something that I'm really, I'll be really excited to see. Um, something that I look forward to. And hopefully maybe um, some of you, or of course, um, including me, can also contribute towards that goal. So I think that will be it for um, this semester's class. So thank you for your um, participation and also taking this class. I hope you enjoyed this class. Um, as I said in the announcement, I think now on just, I think you will be working on your final project and hopefully that will be very related to what you're working on as your for your own research. If you're working on some NLP related research so that you don't have to spend too much time on both two things. And if you are working on something else, NLP, NLP for your research, then I think this will be good uh, opportunity for you to learn about uh, open domain QA. And we're gonna have, a, we, we're still gonna have a two classes next week, Monday and Wednesday again. And, but then we'll use those two classes for the, the lightning talk. So it will not be really lecture, it'll be more of a, your presentations. So that's why today's class is last class. All right, thank you, thank, uh, thanks everyone. And um, I'll see you next week and good luck with your final project.